Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Horses Advocate Podcast. This is Doc T, and this is the month of May in the year of 2023. Now, I don't know if that means anything to you, but it means something to me, and I wanted to share it with you. This represents the first month I started working with horses 50 years ago. So it was May of 1700, right? <laughs> Not that long ago, 1973, that I started my first job working with horses. And I'm pretty excited that these 50 years have brought to me so much joy. And I wanted to share something special with you. Over the next several podcasts, I'm going to um, read my book. And I will just want to share it with you. Uh, I've never done audio version before, and I thought that I would just give it a whirl. So <clears throat> hopefully I do a good job. It's also the 40th year that I've been floating horses teeth. That's four decades. That's a lot of horses that I've done. And I'm also the 39th year of graduating from Cornell Vet School. So I have a lot of stuff in here in my brain that I'm trying to get out to you guys. And it's sometimes overwhelming. Sometimes I dig deep into the weeds and try to give you some answers on a molecular level. And some of you are left with your head spinning. So I just want to give you a timeout, <laughs> no, not a punishment. Just I wanted you to hear my book. And it's going to take several podcasts to do it. Hopefully I get you engaged in it. I might do them all in a row. I might spread them out over uh, the summer. You know, just putting them in there just to give ourselves a little bit of a break. But either way, I just want to bring it to you. Become a member if you become a member of the Horses Advocate. You can get my book in PDF form, and it's just part of the membership. So you can read it there yourself. Of course, you can get it on Amazon. Going to my name, Jeff Tucker DVM. Be sure to put G E O F F T U C K E R comma space. DVM, and you'll see my three books there. But I just want to read this book to you. Okay, here we go. Since the days of the Romans, my journey of discovering a life with horses by Jeff Tucker, DVM. Second edition, 2017. Since the days of the Romans, I was looking forward to a pleasant routine call as I turned up the long driveway leading to a farm located in the hills at the southern end of my practice. My client had scheduled Coggins tests, vaccinations, and teeth floating for her two horses. I could see that no one was in the barn, so I walked to the house. In outside appearance, the two-story white clapboard colonial looked typical for the area. I entered the garage and knocked on the door, calling out, Dr. Tucker, anyone home? A distant voice replied, come on into the kitchen, Doc. I was hit with warm, moist air and my nostrils filled with chlorine as I passed through the first room of the house with its hidden pool. It made me think that this wealthy woman believed in healthy living in the cold upstate New York area. But the hidden pool, like an oasis inside the old farmhouse, wasn't what was unusual about my routine call that day. The woman, a new client for me, was sitting at her kitchen table. Clear morning light poured through the large window over the sink, passing through handmade white linen curtains spotted with colorful shapes of vegetables. Tucked into the corner of the room, the table had the hallmark of being the social center of the house. The smell of coffee added warmth. A man was seated, and he was quickly introduced to me as her guest. His appearance was itself unusual because he was not dressed in a way that was typical for the area. Men usually wore work boots and functional clothing on the farms I visited. While the woman wore clothes for barn chores, this man wore pressed slacks, a long-sleeved Oxford shirt with button-down collar, and a dark brown cashmere wool sweater vest. 
his head was topped with a type of cap that called up images of Sherlock Holmes, and he wore black leather loafers with tassels that were definitely not suited for farm work. He seemed proper, relaxed, and professional. I knew that her guest was not a horseman, but was surprised with her candid introduction when she said, he's my psychotherapist. Well, I thought to myself, I know plenty of horse people who might benefit from hiring a psychotherapist, including myself. Noting their apparent comfort with each other, I also wondered to myself exactly what kind of therapy he was providing in addition to his regular services. I was asked permission for him to come to the barn to see what kind of work I did. And I happily agreed, thinking I may glean therapeutic benefit for myself during the visit. We all headed to the barn with a man measuring his steps in an attempt to keep his loafers clean. I never expected him to be the man to confirm a deep-seated feeling I had been ignoring all my life. As I worked with the horses, I discussed basic horse care with the owner while the therapist stood by quietly watching. These are two very different horses, aren't they? He asked during a silent pause in our discussion, surprising me with his accurate assessment. You're very correct. These are two distinctly different horses, I answered, surprised. Tell me, what do you see? One of them seems so calm and relaxed and understanding, he said. The other seems more aloof and inquisitive, but in a fearful sort of way. He was exactly right. You have nailed their personalities, which surprises me since you don't have any experience with horses, I said. He responded, in the type of therapy I do, I read auras. I can see these horses' auras and their personalities are what I read. I was speechless, and the world stopped. It had been many years since my first job with horses. I'd learned about reading auras and incorporated it into my work with horses. It had become so much second nature that I rarely consciously thought about it. Now, a non-horseman, human psychotherapist, had rekindled the memory from my beginning days of working with horses in 1973. With an effort, I brought myself back to the present, where I'd just finished with the first of the horses. I turned to look at the man. Is there anything else you can tell me about these horses, I asked. That's it, he said, and I felt a moment's disappointment before he added, but I do read people's auras, and you have a strong one. The therapist told me that I had two strong auras, one for healing and one for teaching. I nodded, but thought privately, well, that's a no-brainer. I'm a veterinarian, for crying out loud. Of course I'm into healing, and he has just listened to me talk about horses with the owner, so he knows I like to teach as I work. But there's one more thing, Dr. Tucker, the therapist said, but I don't know if you want to hear it. Well, if you want to tweak somebody's curiosity, just say something like that. I couldn't just let the conversation end there. I insisted he tell me what he was feeling, even if it was something he wasn't sure I'd wanted to know. The aura reader said, this isn't the first life you've lived with horses. I felt a chill as he continued. It's clear to me that you've been working with horses since the days of the Romans. Unlike many equine veterinarians, I hadn't been raised around horses. However, I'd taken to them and they had taken to me with an ease that surprised me. I had always felt that I'd been around them in previous lives. My mind flew to another memory, an old and very wise horseman who owned a farm in New York once told me, you can live your whole life with horses, die, be born again, live your whole life again with horses, die, be born again, and so on. After many such lives, you might just start to understand them. Had I lived many lives with horses? Was it my destiny to live this life again with them? Why had a three-time college dropout 
a kid with a reading disability, a person with no experience with horses for the first 20 years of his life, been drawn almost with divine purpose into a life that complemented my inner being. On a routine call, a man who had nothing to do with horses had given me a revelation. Maybe this wasn't my first time around with horses. Maybe I have been with them since the days of the Romans. Introduction. This is a book about the adventures I've taken from just after high school through graduation from veterinary school. Those various twists and turns are interspersed with stories in italics of horses and their owners that I came across early in my veterinary career, every one of them true. I wrote this book because I know so many people suffer from what I have known as a life without direction and may even be tempted to give up. Leaping into unknown areas in life is upsetting and frightening. Roadblocks are annoying at best and insurmountable at worst, yet still there's hope. I left high school unable to read well enough to have any chance at good college exam scores. I was the son of a family of Ivy League school graduates, a boy uninterested in animals, a loner with no direction, and a three-time college dropout. How could someone like me make it into the top veterinary college in the world and become successful at treating horses throughout the United States? Against all odds, I achieved what makes me happy. I had support and love along the way, which is imperative to success. This is a story of overcoming adversity to become what life has in mind for you in spite of yourself. It is based on a life with horses, but applies to every person on earth. I am not the only one to find direction and purpose in a life of chaos, but my message is clear to those who may not believe this. If I can do it, then so can you. Let's start with my thoughts about horses. A horse can kill you. It's a fact. They are large animals with minds of their own, yet horses hold an elevated position in our collective imagination. They are beautiful, graceful, and have been part of human existence for thousands of years. In prior generations, those who owned horses depended on their ability to work to transport, and to make daily life easier. But they also love their horses. Steal a man's wife, and he might punch you in the mouth. But steal his horse, and you'd be hung from the nearest tree. While these days we depend much less on a horse's ability to work, horse people still love their animals, not because they are pretty, though they are, or because they are easy to care for, they are not. The love comes from a special reciprocal connection a person and a horse develop. It becomes a true friendship, one often not found between two humans. My name is Jeff Tucker, and I'm an equine veterinarian, a horse doctor. Now, you may assume that I grew up on a farm or ranch, or that I've been around horses all my life, and that's how I developed such a love for them. You'd be wrong. My father was a corporate lawyer in Manhattan. That is about as far removed from a farm as any place I know. I wasn't raised with mud on my boots and straw between my teeth, but somehow, some way, I found my place in the world with horses. When I think about it now, I wonder how in the heck I could have possibly ended up in this line of work and loving my life. It was a long and twisting road but one I'd travel again tomorrow if I could get the same result. I suppose everyone at some point takes a step back and wonders how things have come together through the years to create their life. Success seems like an elusive thing for so many. So why did it happen that I became successful almost in spite of myself? I have heard numerous definitions for success from being gifted to being the result of hard work. Though I'd certainly never call myself gifted, I do work hard. Luck is another common reason given by many for success, though I believe that the real definition of luck is when preparedness meets opportunity. 
I think the combination of success and happiness is much more than that, though. In my case, there had to be some divine guidance involved for my very disjointed and improbable path in life to produce such results. I never had a horse growing up. I had a dog and a cat, but the cat was run over and the dog was dog napped for research. It seems that Weimaraner dogs have little hair and fat, so they are useful for research. And it turned out that three Weimaraner dogs disappeared in our area that very same weekend. As for horses, I rode only two between the time I was born and the time I turned 19 years old. The only reason I started going to horse barns at all was to hunt for good-looking girls. In my entire childhood, there were no hamsters, birds, snakes, fish, or insects placed in glass tanks for hours of observation by a curious scientific mind. There was one exception. In anticipation of the annual July 4th festivities, my mom often cleaned several used glass peanut butter jars with metal screw-on lids. Using a nail, we punched small air holes in the lids and added a handful of grass and twigs to the jars. The time before sunset was occupied with playing ball, swimming, or bicycling with our red, white, and blue streamers flying in the breeze. The family feasted on the standard picnic fare. In the pause before fresh strawberry shortcake made its entrance, my sister and I would dance around the glowing darkness trapping lightning bugs as they lit up the night with their glowing tails. I got one would be heard repeatedly as we trapped the mystical creatures in the jar. As we stuffed fresh July strawberries and hand whipped cream covered with sugar into our mouths, we marveled at the silent explosions of light coming from the trapped bugs. Even though I never owned a horse, somewhere in my early years, a connection with animals was forged and then laid dormant for more than a decade. Much like all children, I had dreams. I wanted to become a world-class swimmer, then a scuba diver, then an oceanographer, then a construction worker, then a photographer, then a truck driver, then a horseman, and finally a veterinarian. As I look back, I laugh as I imagine a divine finger trying to steer this haphazard, seemingly directionless life into a specific course. Along the way, people with good intentions, either directly or indirectly, got in my way. I heard things like, you gotta be smart to do something like that. Who do you think you're kidding? Nobody in your family has ever done anything like that. And don't embarrass your family. Guilt was often heaped and piled with words as well as facial expressions, hand gestures, and body actions. The result of that discouragement could have been devastating for my dream, but I had, as of yet, no dream to snuff. I was just experiencing life, so it rolled off me like a distant wolf howl for the most part. Sometimes, though, I thought that maybe they were right. Maybe I just wasn't suited for anything. My self-esteem was tiring of playing defense, but no plan was showing to improve it. My friends and family, thankfully, had a different attitude than all the naysayers. They had a more laissez-faire approach to child rearing, and I was allowed to aimlessly pursue life as I would an endless buffet table from the time I left home. As I bounced around from one profession to another, trying them on for size, excuses were made that could have suppressed my self-esteem further, but it didn't. Rather, the opposite occurred. I noticed that I was really good at everything I did, but I just wasn't clicking with one thing. Nothing held my attention for long, and I didn't feel passionate about the various things I tried. For example, our football team was undefeated for three years in high school, but I didn't want to play football after that. I dove underwater in Florida caves and Atlantic shipwrecks at night, but I didn't want to do it every day the rest of my life. I could park an 18-wheel semi-truck on a dime, but I had no excitement about mile after mile of highway rolling by. I felt like I had the skills to literally do anything, but I hadn't found the one thing that I really wanted to do. 
As I was searching for what would really make me happy, two things happened. First, I became a friend, then husband, to a woman who had absolute faith in me. She opened my eyes to the wide range of possibilities for my future that I hadn't even considered. She propped up my self-esteem and nurtured it, giving me the confidence to believe in myself as much as she did. For this, I am eternally grateful. The second thing that happened to me was that I became aware of life as a process that always sought to be neutral. Life wasn't for me or against me. It just existed with no favorites. No invisible force kept me from what I wanted. In fact, the only thing in my way was me. From a position of neutral, I learned that all things became possible. In other words, any position away from neutral prevents life from unfolding the way it should. Fear and scarcity, such as worry and doubt, set up roadblocks. Blind ambition or forcing an outcome creates energy that repels things and prevents you from seeing all possibilities. Everything good that has happened in my life came from being neutral and allowing. It also came from very hard work and focus, but always came from a neutral state, which allowed for all the possibilities and changes in life's direction to occur. As I think back over the decades of my life, I can pinpoint when my direction changed and good things came to me. Those times were always associated with being happy, being in the moment, and not worrying about what if. It is with horses that I came to know what neutral means and how to just exist in happiness. I was about eight years old and my family, mom, dad, and sister Judy, had gone to Texas for a week. Dad had a business meeting there and we stayed at a ranch. There I met Patches and the love of horses had me for good. At my next birthday party, I unwrapped a stuffed horse and named him Patches. I slept with him every night until an embarrassingly older age. I was about 13 years old when our family again took a trip, this time to Seattle, Washington. We stayed near the Mount Rainier National Park, and I rode a horse high up on the trails. I remember that I did not have fun riding. To me, it was boring, except for the moment when somebody saddle slipped and they went rolling off the side of their horse and almost died sliding down the, into the ravine. I could just imagine all the straight-faced horses laughing at these foolish humans. Back in the barn, however, you couldn't pull me away from the smells and the presence of the horses in the stable. I spent as much time as I could there doing nothing but, well, just being. Next to riding patches in Texas, I was probably as close to being neutral in that moment or just plain happy as I had ever been. Yet I was a city kid in a horse barn. It didn't make much sense. Is there a divine plan that connects everything? I don't know. But I do find it interesting that nearly 50 years later, my favorite horse to work on in my practice is named Rainier. And every time I see that horse, it reminds me of that happy time near Mount Rainier National Park when I was 13. Her Loving Arms My mind spun while I tried to assess the damage to my body. I had just vaccinated the horse and drawn blood for a Coggins test with no problem. When I started to float his teeth, the horse objected to the point of requiring sedation. I injected the medication and he settled down nicely. I was just standing there talking to the trainer, not really paying attention to the horse as I waited for the sedation to take effect. As I turned back to the horse to insert my float into his mouth, the drugged horse opened his mouth and lunged as hard as he could at me. The large chestnut gelding's teeth landed hard in the center of my chest, and I was thrown against the wall. I quickly peeled back my layers of goose down, chamois shirt, and t-shirt, and saw the skin of my left breast bruised and torn. My mouth hung open in shock as I stared at the horse and then at the owner, whose eyes were wide. The sedated horse just stood there with his head hanging low, asleep and in another world. I gathered myself and left the barn, 
hoping that my day could continue without a trip to the hospital. I pulled into a parking lot to do a quick self-assessment, and as I peeled back the clothing, saw purple, red, green, and yellow bruising, but the bleeding had stopped. I decided to continue with my day, though very sore. My next stop was a pony boarding barn run by the sweetest little lady named Ruth. Ruth was in her mid-60s and lived alone on the farm. She had been the person who had started every adult horseman in the area when they were children. Now she was teaching their children. Everyone loved Ruth, and she loved them and lived for her ponies. Ruth called me young, handsome vet, and whenever I arrived on her farm for a visit, her energy was equal to a puppy wagging its tail. This day, I pulled into Ruth's barnyard, and she met me with worried eyes. She saw something was wrong before I had taken a step. This is how horsemen are. They are connected to everyone and everything around them and can sense when something is wrong. I quickly told her about the attack, trying to brush it aside. Her eyes gazed in worry at my chest, and she demanded to see it. Honestly, it was a mess, but with a quick glance, then a touch, she took action. Against my protest, she left me in the barn and disappeared inside the tack room. I waited as I heard doors and drawers slam in response to her search. Soon she emerged carrying the items she deemed necessary for my healing. After shedding my shirts, Ruth skillfully started to wrap a horse bandage around my chest, incorporating a large ice pack over my wound. To pass a wrap around me, I automatically lifted my arms into the air like a compliant patient as she stepped close to me. With her body pressed against me, the small woman stretched her loving arms around to pass the wrap from one hand to the other. She lingered and then I felt the hug. She finished the job in silence with two more turns around me, then taped the end securely. I suddenly realized that this woman, loved by so many, was very alone. She smiled, and her sense of accomplishment was beaming as she stepped back, saying, that will help a lot. I knew her love had helped me that day, and maybe I had helped her a little bit as well. Ruth was a tough angel to all who entered her life, including me. I had several calls to her farm over the next year, and she always inquired about my chest. The day I heard of her sudden death from an asthma attack, I was in shock. Ruth helped so many with their journey into the world of horses and placed her loving arms around so many, including me, and I'll never forget her. Chapter One, Swing and a Miss. Chapter One. There were many times in my life I had what I call a swing and a miss in choosing a profession. Though I consider my time in Ohio to be the beginning of my life with horses, we can't appreciate it unless we go back years earlier to New Hampshire, Hanover to be exact. The autumn day was crisp and brilliant. My dad, mom, my sister Judy, and I had driven in our Ford Country Squire from Chappaqua, New York, to visit dad's alma mater, Dartmouth College. Mom packed a tailgate picnic, including fried chicken, cornbread, and deviled eggs. We drank fresh apple cider and lusted for the homemade spiced oatmeal raisin cookies we called Oatmeal Rocks. Dad was a 1936 graduate of Dartmouth, then continued after graduation to earn his business degree at Dartmouth's Tuck School of Business. He then went on to Harvard to attain his degree in law and became a corporate lawyer for CIT Financial Corporation in New York City. My grandfather on my father's side also attended Dartmouth and later became an executive at Westinghouse. Somewhere in the 1920s, Westinghouse sent him and his family, including my dad, to live in Japan for three years. These two immediate ascendants of mine were definitely movers and shakers and, quite frankly, smart. It doesn't end there. We are blood relatives of William Jewett Tucker, who also attended Dartmouth in 1861. He later became a doctor of theology 
and in 1886 became the minister of a church in Amherst, Massachusetts. Dr. Tucker published an article accommodating Darwin's theory of evolution in his church, as well as support of other radical views. Because of these views, the congregation charged him and four others with heresy. His case made it to the Massachusetts Supreme Court, where he was acquitted of all charges. The mark of his case was later a part of the famous Scopes Monkey Trial. Later, Dartmouth begged Dr. Tucker to become the president of the college, and in 1893, he accepted the position. Through his efforts, he earned the appellation, quote, founder of the new Dartmouth, from which the college today and its graduates are benefactors. I was in Hanover buying anything dark green with a white D on it. I was a natural for Dartmouth, and we were attending the football game so I, too, could learn the spirit of the campus. Few years of my childhood passed without Dartmouth football games and the Dartmouth choir singing all the college songs, which I memorized and sang constantly. Oh, Eliezer Wheelock was a very pious man. The Hanover Winter Song, the Twilight Song, and Dartmouth Undying. Decals covered my windows and pennants adorned the walls. I was a natural for this place. Unfortunately, as it turns out, my ancestry, memorabilia, and long memorization were not enough for me to get into Dartmouth. They apparently were looking for grades. The rejection letter arrived in the mail, and a stunned silence enveloped the house for days. Now what? After that, the other college rejections letters hit our mailbox in rapid fire, as if I were standing in front of a firing squad. The first bullet did not kill me, nor the second. I hung in there, helpless to stop the carnage as the last bullet of college rejections ripped into me. 90% of my high school went on to college and my guidance counselor was going to make sure that all of his students got there. He had been working on me for years, sending me to remedial classes, hoping something said there would spark a flame in me. While I was sure that Dartmouth was where I was going, I really had no desire to go to college other than I was supposed to go. That's what my family did. They went to college. There was no direction in my life, but there sure was the pressure of what the rest of the family had achieved academically. The counselor called me to his office after he had heard of my embarrassing number of college rejections and said he had been working with a college on my behalf. He said that if I were were willing to leave before high school graduation, they would accept me into a summer experimental program. Because I was looking for rescue at this point, and it was my one and only offer from any college, I accepted it. In mid-May, I enrolled in Ohio Wesleyan University in Delaware, Ohio. It was two weeks before high school graduation. My time at Ohio Wesleyan didn't last long. While I loved the computer class, and had been working with computers since 1969. I hated being in the computer room until the wee hours of the morning, trying to find the one line of code that made a pointless program work. Of course, I didn't know that Bill Gates was doing the same thing almost at the exact time, somewhere on the other side of the country. The difference was that he loved computer code and was passionate about it. I wasn't. If my life were a campfire, at this point, you would be giving up on me ever catching a fire. Combustible lighter fluid and matches are being thrown on wet wood and wet leaves with no hope of catching a spark. I borrowed a friend's 350cc Honda dirt bike and drove 30 miles outside of town and found a cemetery. Alone, I sat asking the spirits around me what I should do. They decided the best thing for me was to lower the temperature to about 35 degrees and have a fun bike ride back to the dorm. With a frozen body, I decided this school wasn't for me. I sat alone trying to warm up and think warm thoughts. Then I applied to Oceanography School in Jensen Beach, Florida. The Florida Institute of Technology had just opened up a new school called the School of Marine and Environmental Technology. We called it FIT Summit. 
because they were new, they accepted anybody. And I was just somebody with money to pay for tuition. Now, this school was fun. Diving underwater was an integral part of oceanography, and I already was a scuba diver certified by the YMCA, the first official certification program. I virtually lived underwater during high school. I watched all of Jacques Cousteau's shows and read everything he wrote. I drew pictures of an underwater house I was going to live in one day. Being underwater was a major spark in my life, and that is where you could find me on any summer's day I could get away from work. My life seemed to be nowhere near horses. I was learning oceanography and photography at FIT, but I never saw a horse while I was in school there. I hated the classwork and I still didn't understand why I couldn't do well on tests, even when I knew the material. I was ready for a change after only a short time at the new college, but that change was almost made for me by a seemingly innocuous event unrelated to my education near Christmas in 1972. I almost became a felon. I owned a 1969 blue Ford Econoline van that could hold plenty of people and therefore had become a friend to many. When Christmas break came, about six people asked if they could split the gas and ride north with me. Sweet deal, I thought. Before sunup, we all piled in the van and were in good spirits as we drove north to our homes. Interstate 95 did not exist yet in South Florida, so I was heading north on U.S. Run and U.S. Route A1A along the east coast of Florida between Fort Pierce and Melbourne. These were two-lane back roads that transected every small town between Miami and Jacksonville. In the micro town of Grant, about an hour north of campus, I got pulled over for speeding in a 35 mile an hour zone. The police officer checked out the long hairs in the van and forced me to drive to a house on a back street of town. It was still dark and I was in no position to argue with the officer. Everyone in the van kept very quiet. I was instructed to leave the van and follow the officer. My nerves were jumping out of my skin. We entered the house where I was warned to mind my manners. He said, the judge will see you in a minute. Have a seat. I sat in the living room of his house on high alert. I'd seen this in a movie once and I didn't like the ending. My upbringing kicked in as the judge entered the living room in his bathrobe and sat at his desk. The words out of my mouth were limited to yes, sir, no, sir, and I'm sorry along with the final, thank you, sir, as I shelled out $35 cash and he wrote something in his big ledger. There were no computers or even a recording of my license, just a warning not to speed in his town ever again, or I would be in bigger trouble. I crept up the coast and dropped the first batch of friends off in Washington, D.C. and made it to New York without further incident. On the trip back to Florida, I picked up everyone at their homes. Two of my so-called friends were really happy. They retold the story of their near bust we had experienced and thanked me for being so cool. Why, I asked. They laughed and said, we didn't want to tell you and we're glad you didn't know, but we had a suitcase full of drugs, man. That's why. I started to rethink my life with these friends right then and severed my ties quickly. It became the start of me never really trusting people. Aside from this close call of becoming a felon, there were some good things that came from the school. For instance, my love of photography really began here. I had never been officially instructed in photography until I had been required to take photography courses as part of the oceanographic curriculum at Fitzsummit. My dad had taught me about photography when I was 12, I can still hear him say today, quote, the larger the number, the smaller the hole, as he taught me how the f-stop aperture of the camera worked. I joined the eighth grade photography club in 1967, where I developed my first role of black and white film. I learned at a young age about the mystical process of turning light into a paper memory. Dad and mom bought me my first real camera when I was in Florida. It was a Nicromat film camera which wasn't the top shelf, but was better than 90% of the other cameras out there. I went everywhere with that camera and still have some of the photos I took back then. 
I think my parents were hoping they were getting some smoldering embers from my campfire and they were fanning them in hopes of erupting flames. All I knew was that I was very happy taking photographs. I also learned at Fit Summit advanced diving techniques, including deep diving, 150 feet, night diving, salvage diving, and cave diving in Northern Florida. Awesome and beyond belief were descriptions of my diving experiences. Hovering above a sunken ship in the black of night in the Atlantic Gulf Stream off of Palm Beach, not knowing if sharks were close at hand, hiding in the dark was thrilling. Hovering in crystal clear water in the Devil's Eye Cave in Ginny Springs with no light other than our lamps 90 feet below the ground with only one way out is still indescribable. These lessons in self-confidence and self-esteem were absorbed, filling me with all the necessary gumption to make this work, and it almost felt like I was getting somewhere. That is, until marine microbiology. Suddenly, I was again lost in the classroom. It wasn't due to lack of effort, but it was those pesky little exams. One day, I was taking an important exam in marine biology that had really big words made up of smaller words that alone I could remember, but in combination proved too much for my word-mating skills. They all looked the same to me. I looked at the paper and simply wrote, out to lunch, for each question and handed it in. I felt defeated. My roller coaster had been high the weekend before as I dove in the ocean and photographed everything in sight. Now, as the professor called out the grades to the class, his deep voice cleared, then said, and finally, the lowest grade of the exam belongs to the student who wrote, out to lunch for his answers. I packed my things and loaded them into my van. I said goodbye to all my friends I had made there, then wrote a brief note to my mom and dad. It said, quote, I'm leaving Florida. I'll let you know where I am when I get there, close quote. I sealed the envelope, stamped it, and slid it in the outgoing slot at the local post office. I got in my van and headed north to Ohio, the only place where I still had friends, but was far enough away from family in New York to give me some peace. I was embarrassing my family and myself. I felt alone in the world. I pulled into Ohio where I had lived less than a year earlier and quickly learned that many people thought I had died. Someone who looked like me, with the same first name, spelled J-E-F-F, -F, and last name, had drowned canoeing. So when they saw me walking down the street, many screamed or became overwrought. A friend said he had seen a ghost of me once, drenched in water, walking down Main Street. It was fascinating to see, and I was touched that people who had known me for only a year had thought enough of me to mourn or hallucinate. I quickly learned that being broke is not fun. Other than being with a few friends, I wasn't sure I belonged in this town. It was down to my last few dollars. I had sent a note to my parents that if my son had sent to me, I would have hunted him down and kicked his butt. They weren't going to send me any money. I needed a job. An opening was available at the paint manufacturing plant outside of Delaware, Ohio, where I was now living. It was Friday, and I went to their employment office. I was clean and wearing my good clothes when I entered the office. My attitude was positive. The man showed me around and said if I wanted the job, I could start by driving the loader that would fill the railroad cars. The tires were 10 feet tall and a little intimidating. I loved driving anything, as my childhood sandbox filled with graders, loaders, and dump trucks could attest. So I said, sure thing, and I was hired. He said, report here on Monday, 8 a.m. sharp. That weekend, I celebrated and got my funds down to maybe $10. I was on time Monday and reported for work. The foreman said, you never was hired, long hair. Get going now and don't come back. I was numb and drove my van around for a while. Then, as if someone else was steering the van, I drove up a long driveway into a large saddlebred horse farm. I walked up to the person in charge and asked for a job. I was desperate. You ever work with horses before, he asked. No, I replied, but I'm good with my hands and I like to work. He said, wait here and let me get the boss lady. After a while, a well-dressed woman entered the room, followed by her Afghan dog. 
She and her dog had a unique bond, and they even looked similar. I immediately did not like her or her dog, but that wouldn't be important. I was getting a job as a farm groundskeeper and would not be with the horses. At that point, I didn't care because I needed the money. I was teamed up with the old man in charge of the grounds, but I wasn't sure if he liked me or not. I was another pair of hands that he needed for spring cleaning. He had me only doing the things he really did not want to do. I remembered from my short stint in a horse barn at the age of 13 that good-looking girls usually hung around the barns, and with the security of a steady job and the assurance my parents were not coming to get me and kick my butt, I started to go looking for some female friendship. A special note needs to be said again about my non-interfering parents. They never judged me, but loved me where I was, and for that I am eternally grateful. A tall, lean brunette with green eyes and a brilliant smile caught my attention in the barn. Her name was Candy, and she was working hard with a wound-up saddlebred as I screwed up my courage to start talking with her. In no time at all, I was in love, but she was only interested in a friendship. Candy kept me at a, on a very long leash, but I thought, hey, at least I'm on a girl's leash. I'm so dumb sometimes. Candy invited me into the barn for lunch, and I would stay to watch her put a tail set on a horse. This is unique to the saddlebred breed and is required for showing them in competition. I started to spend time with Candy in the barn as well as driving together to and from work. She was living with another man, but I was falling deeper in love with her. I still remember her smile, but of course, I had no chance with her beyond friendship. My introduction to horses in Ohio lasted only a short time, but it was pivotal in setting into motion what still inspires me today. It would take two defining moments before my true passion for a lifetime with horses could really gel. The first was a Johnny Carson show, and the second was witnessing a bizarre medical treatment of a horse. Many people remember watching the Johnny Carson show back in the 1970s. It was really worth staying up past 10 p.m. to watch. I love their variety of guests, especially when he had one with wild animals. The guests would be chatting away while the animal just did what animals do which is often something unexpected and unpredictable, such as slithering across Johnny Carson's desk and into his lap. Johnny's reaction would have me laughing so hard I'd cry. This particular night show was in the spring of 1973, and the famous singer Dean Martin was his guest. He sang a song then sat down with a drink in his hand, obviously a little tipsy, tried to hold a conversation with the host. I was going to turn the show off because it was boring, but I became frozen on the couch with Johnny's next guest. Our next guest, Johnny announced, takes photographs of people's halos. It's called Curlian photography. Please welcome. And out came a man in a suit who sat between Johnny and Dean, two wealthy and iconic men. He was a nobody, really, but he soon became the single most important man in my life. Mr. Martin, would you mind if I place your hand in this lightproof bag? Dean, a little tipsy. Sure thing. Are you going to steal my ring while it's in there? Man said with a serious tone. No, Mr. Martin. I'm going to pass 10,000 volts through your hand, which will cause the auras to glow and will be recorded on the photographic film in the bag. Johnny, as well as everyone else, was bent over laughing with tears flowing from their eyes as Dean desperately looked around and started to get up to leave. He was pulled back down into the chair where he took another long drink of the amber fluid in his glass. Sweat started to form on his brow as he said, t t t 10,000 volts? The man waiting for a break in the laughter reminded everyone that volts don't kill, amps do, and what he was using wouldn't hurt anyone. In an act to assure Dean, the guest performed the process on himself. The Polaroid film developed instantly, and he revealed his finger auras. Then he did Dean's auras. We often see a broken ring aura with alcoholics, the man stated, as he peeled the paper off the film. Sure enough, there were broken rings. Everyone was laughing, but I completely tuned out all the noise and thought, wow, energy off the fingertips.
The next day at the barn near lunchtime, I went to find candy. While I waited, I visited a large chestnut gelding who was afraid of everything. Eyes bugged and nostrils flared. The big horse stayed in the back of the stall, snorting at me, the stranger. His neck went vertical and his head tilted slightly sideways, his bulging right eyeball staring deeply into my face, reading every nuance of every expression I made. The chains that saddlebreds wear around their artificially raised hooves made ominous noise as he pranced in place, almost like a rattlesnake warning me to stay far away. Since I just realized we all give off energy, I wondered if this horse could sense that. Horses are notorious for being able to sense fear in those around them. I wondered if this horse could sense calm. I stood in the stall doorway and focused on relaxing completely. I released a long breath out of my nostrils and slowly lifted my right hand, palm down. I focused on emitting calm energy off my fingertips toward the horse. To my shock and amazement, the horse dropped his head, slowly exhaled in response, and then advanced towards me, gently touching his nose to my fingers. I was thrilled and overwhelmed. I had made my first real connection with a horse, and I was hooked. This incident plays in my mind almost every day as I encounter new horses, and it had a huge bearing on my eventual decision to become a veterinarian. The second life-changing event occurred one day when I was outside raking leaves on the farm. The quiet morning was split with an explosion. I froze for a moment and then started to rake again. Kaboom! Again, but this time, I vectored the sound to determine that it was coming from the indoor arena. With the third explosion, I abandoned my station and went to the arena to investigate. I entered the front of the building that led into the observation area. Sitting there was a trainer and assistant trainer. In the ring alone was a wide-eyed, vertically-necked, blood-bay horse walking freely about the ring. I asked simply, what's going on? The trainer said, this mare has colic. I asked, what's that? He looked at me, finally recognizing that I was the outdoor guy that didn't know anything about horses other than the cute girls that worked with them. He informed me that colic is an upset stomach in the horse. When they get it, he said with a slight arrogance in his tone. They like to roll to ease the pain. Unfortunately, when rolling, they sometimes twist their intestines into a knot, and if that happens, they die. To prevent the horse from rolling, we throw ash cans, cherry bombs, and M80s to scare them into running. He had quite an arsenal of explosives in a bag. He looked at the horse and saw she was pawing the ground. This was something a horse with a bellyache would do just before getting down to roll. The trainer withdrew a round red cherry bomb with a long green stem and lit the fuse with his lighter. Arching the sparking colic treatment into the air toward the horse, his aim and timing was perfect. Just before hitting the ground and about 10 feet from the horse, it exploded. The sound inside the arena was so much louder than what I had heard outside, with thundering echoes bouncing off the walls and ceiling. The horse leapt into the air and ran with all her might, eyes almost popping out of her head and nostrils flared with each full stride of her long hind legs. A short staccato eruption of gas escaped her anus. That'll fix her guts, the trainer said with some laughter of contempt. Something unexplainable rose in me. My guts and my conscience screamed that what I was seeing was wrong. I felt that horse's fear and pain, but there was nothing I could do to ease it. I quickly turned and left the building. I went to find Candy, but she said that she was leaving for Massachusetts the next day and would stay in touch. This crushed my dream of being with her. I soon found myself heartsick and just plain sick with what was later determined to be a bad case of mononucleosis. It was time for me to go. I had $24 cash and a full tank of gas as I left Ohio and returned to New York. I crawled into my childhood bed at my parents' home and fell asleep for three days. When I finally woke up, I realized that I was going to remain with horses somehow, some way. I knew in the deepest part of myself that they would be my passion and my life. 
I had finally found my purpose and direction. Story. Put her down, Doc. She's as good as dead. The dark winter's evening sky had enveloped the land, and my regular day was done. My bones were warming, and my stomach was filled with great food. This evening would be perfect if I had no emergencies and I could snuggle into my warm bed piled high with a feather comforter. My long day wasn't over as the answering service called about a colic 45 minutes away. Risking this being interpreted wrong, I have to say that I enjoyed working on colics. For me, it was an easy diagnostic exercise with concise parameters that could be interpreted accurately. My goal was to determine if the horse had a medical colic or surgical colic, and I had developed a reputation at Cornell's emergency clinic of being not only accurate, but because I sent them in early, about 90% returned home after surgery, and an excellent outcome. I drove through the evening with confidence in my abilities to quickly assess this horse's situation and return home with another successful outcome. Helping my confidence was the trainer who had called me. He was a professional with experience, and I knew he was calling me about a serious colic. He knew the difference between a minor issue and something serious and would never have called me if it were other than serious. I pulled up in front of a long pole barn with a roof higher than in most. I gathered my equipment and briskly walked in the cold January air through the dimly lit barn. The trainer stood in front of the open door and without looking up at me said, put her down, doc. She's as good as dead. I quickly looked in and saw a familiar picture of a blanketed horse laying down in the middle of the concave floor. She was covered in a thin layer of bedding shavings collected in the material of the blanket and hair of her mane from rolling about in agony. Her eyes were glazed and distant and the nostrils flared. The odor of sweat mixed with the smells of urine, manure, and old shavings penetrated my senses and added dramatically to the scene before me. I've tried everything short of beating her to get her up, the trainer said. It's no good. I knew this trainer would have tried every way he knew to get the horse to stand. If she wouldn't, there was really nothing that could be done other than relieve her misery. I started back towards the truck to get my euthanasia solution, but almost like you see in a cartoon, I felt an angel on my shoulder speaking clearly in my ear. Wait, you went to Cornell. What did they teach you there? They taught you to do a full exam. Go back and do a full exam. I turned on my heel and went back to the horse that was now moaning. I bent down with my stethoscope and listened to the heart. The rate was only slightly elevated. I could hear a moderate amount of gurgling in the abdomen, and my training started to tell me that this wasn't a serious colic. What was it? I asked myself silently. My mind was evaluating the situation as I decided I obviously had to get this horse up to examine the other side. To get her up, I first needed to get her blanket off, but it was twisted tightly about her body. I unbuckled everything, but the last thigh strap was very tight. I struggled to release the tension, and after successfully releasing it, laid the blanket to the side and gently tapped her back with my toe. The mare sprung to her feet, did a full body shake, and walked over to her hay and started to eat. The trainer and I both stood with our mouths dropped open in disbelief as we altered our gaze from her to each other and back to her. I was the first to laugh out loud as we both realized that this very sensitive national show horse thought she was dying from a thigh strap that was too tight and pinching her leg. Talk about a drama queen. The trainer involuntarily made himself small with bent knees as he quickly walked out of the barn in complete embarrassment. I turned to my shoulder and thanked my angel. Hey everyone, Doc T here. Thank you for listening to my content. Would you do me a huge favor? Would you please subscribe, comment, like, thumbs up, and give a star review? However it's presented to you, I want you to do that. There are two reasons. The first, of course, is to improve this product. This way I know what you like, what you don't like, what I can improve upon, what topics you want me to cover. But more importantly, it's also gonna help others find me. 
And by doing that, you are now engaged in this mission of helping horses thrive in a human world. By you helping, we can reach others. And that I would be so grateful for. And remember, go to thehorsesadvocate.com for updates on this information. Thehorsesadvocate.com. And again, thank you so much for being here. Doc T out.